Pikes went on to be used during the English Civil War in the 17th century. It was the last time a Scottish king was killed on English soil. So what we've done here is we tried to so show you some of the soldiers. Gentlemen, if you'd like to charge the crowd on your orders. That about 50 people scared to death. Very, very grateful to Barclay Jouse today and all the reenactors and all of you to listen to my commentary. If you're interested in more about the Battle of Flodden's Day, I've got a display over at the end of the traders' fair. But for the moment, thank you very much. Flodden feels so exquisitely well. Gave you all a good insight into what's going on up at Flodden next weekend at the recreation of the Battle of Flodden and the opening of the new Flodden Museum up there. As I said before, also, Charles Barkley has expressed a very clean and personal interest into this particular event. But they found this was very, very inaccurate, so they changed. They, they went over to a lead ball or a stone ball, and these were called pelletta, and that's where we get the word pellet from. Now you can see they're just about loaded. Now normally, they would keep the linstock with them, but for safety, we don't like to have people handling powder and match all at the same time. So we keep them separate, as you've just seen. And we're ready. You can see the collineator is now putting some fine powder on top of the gun. And when it's lit, it should burn through and the gun will go off. Gunners, in your own time, please give fire. After a while, you can't get the ball down the barrel. The British Army solved this by using a barrel of around 0.79 of an inch and a ball of 0.6 of an inch. So there's a huge gap. Yes, Eric, thank you. Right, now we've got them organized. What we're gonna do now is show you the next development in firearms. In the early 1800s, the Reverend Forsyth was out hunting wildfowl, and he was using a flintlock. And he didn't like the fact that the flintlock had a big flash out the side. It would scare the ducks and the geese, and he'd miss. He didn't like this at all, so he came up with a new way of doing it. And what they did was they produced something called a fulminate of mercury. This is a highly volatile substance, which when struck, gives off a very large flame. It's very unstable. And they put this into little copper cups and sat them upon a nipple which was attached directly to the chamber. When the hammer strikes the percussion cap, the firearm will discharge. Now this has a number of advantages. It's far more reliable and it makes the firearm almost waterproof because you can load them with paper cartridges, use a percussion cap, it has spiraling grooves in the barrel. And what that does is it spins the bullet and makes it far more stable. This gives great accuracy and an Enfield rifle could easily engage targets out to 800 yards. So a complete difference from all the firearms you've seen before where you'd be lucky to hit something at 30 to 40 yards. So Simon, when you're ready. And as you can see, it works very well. Uh, it wasn't very strong in some ways, and it was very, very cumbersome to load. So what they would do is they'd put all the powder in the front of each cylinder and a ball on top and press it in place one at a time. You can literally take the cylinder out, put a preloaded cylinder straight back in, and within 20 to 30 seconds, you're ready to fire again. Go for James and get some percussion caps. James, he's got no caps. Well, what can you do with them all? I mean... <laughs> just, just, just down in the back, down in the back. I can see. I have to manually cock it and then pull the trigger. When you're ready, Peter. There's number one. Two. Five. And 
and six shots. And the wadding is being placed in on top of the ball. You can see it being rammed home. You'll also notice there are lots of people serving the gun. They were called servants of the gun. The reason for this is because the master gunner was paid for the gun and crew. So the canny gunner would use his family, women, children, whoever he could get, because if he used his own family, he kept all the money. Would you please, Mr. Bruce? It's there somewhere. And as you can see, we still have problems with the match. And there she goes. You now see a man rush forward, and he's putting a wet mop down the barrel. The reason for this is to put out any burning embers. He'll then use a dry mop to dry the barrel. And the lady you can see is advancing with more powder. If you don't put out all the embers in the bottom of the barrel, as the powder goes in, the gun goes off, and the loader tends to lose a hand. Very bad form. So we always clean the barrels. This was something they discovered very, very early on. If you don't run a gun in exactly the right way, it will go wrong badly. Now the word cannon barrel. Cannon barrels were originally made the same as a wooden barrel. You had long staves of iron that were held together with iron hoops in exactly the same way they made wooden barrels. And that is why it is called a gun barrel. Now being made by blacksmiths, as you can imagine, some blacksmiths are excellent, some are very good, and some not so good. If your barrel was made by a blacksmith who was not so good, you had a good chance that the gun would explode. And they regularly did, killing their crews. It was a very dangerous occupation. Time, Mr. Bruce. It's not really good for knocking down large fortifications and castles. This cannon is actually designed for use on the field against troops. It is a field gun. The way this cannon would be used would be between two blocks of infantry. It would advance with the infantry, and when it got to a convenient d distance of the enemy, it would fire a single shot of 42 musket balls into the enemy line. So it's a giant shotgun, if you like. 42 musket balls coming out very, very quickly into the enemy ranks would hopefully make a big hole. When that happens, the two troops, either side of the gun, will run forward in wedge formation and enter that gap. And that's how these guns were used. That's why they're so small and so portable. It's so that they can get in and out of very quickly. Because, of course, the enemy are trying to do exactly the same to you. So if you go forward and your gun misfires or you don't kill enough troops, then you have to be able to run away very, very quickly. You'll see the other one's almost there already. He'll now prime it in exactly the same way you saw the other gun. Here comes shot two. Oh, he's going for a fourth one. That wasn't in the script. That really wasn't in the script. They're, they're making this up as they go along. Oh, I can see why. This should be our last and final shot, ladies and gentlemen. And there you are, ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude our demonstration for you today. It's one down from the English team. like strong contenders. <laughs> oh. It's not a good day for my friend in red. <laughs> Wales again.
What we have here, ladies and gents, is a free for all. One down already. Two. They're dropping like flies. Oh, coming in from the rear. My friend Red is really gunning for Griff. Griff's the one with the rag on his back. That's the loudest you've been all day. Well done. Oh, 
Well done. A good clean break now. Holding his horse back. And now let's it go. Oh, but the Frenchman appears to have thrown this one. Oh, comedy gold. You couldn't make it up, could you? My Lord Beaufort is being given maximum points for that pass because the Frenchman threw the pass. Bizarre. And he just sits there, cool as a cucumber, and twice as arrogant. My Lord Wofford appears to be taking the list backwards, than usual. <laughs> He's a very skilled horseman, obviously. And they're off! Oh, good clean break there again from the Frenchman. Brave try, my Lord. Unfortunate. Brave try. And I can report at the end of that. Sir Nicolas Saint Pantalon has four little sticks. My Lord Beaufort has three little sticks. Yay! Saint Pantalon, he hasn't got any. And they're off. Ooh. Oh, well done, sir. Well done. Beautifully done. A convincing clean break there on the body. Um, Mr. Edmund is coming this way. Let's face it, you have to be fairly confident to wear a helmet crest like that. That has got trophy written all over it. And they're off! Oh, fantastically well done. Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond, again, a beautiful clean break there. What's going wrong, sir? You are riding so well. Has your nerve deserted you? Your Gallic courage? Where and is the it? Frenchman looking a bit sorry for himself. Oh. Very sporting, unexpected. Well done, my lord. Very noble of you. Is they allay? Oh, beautiful. Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond, another clean break there. Ladies with the scores, what can we say? Skip over this way, darling. We have Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond, on how many? On nine points. And my Lord Beaufort on three. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't you just saddle up the large gentleman in the pink hat? He's taller than your horse. <laughs> Boom! Oh, is that a double strike there? He's coming up from the crowd. Yep. I'm the one! I'm the one! And we have a Saxon over there. Gentlemen, Lizzie Alley! Woo! Oh! Gentlemen, when you're ready. Leslie and Lee! Oh, beautifully done, gentlemen. Beautifully done. Wow, well, what do we think of that? Oh, and they're off! Beautifully done. A dragon, a dragon! White dragon! White dragon of Wessex! That was a uh, clean break for John de Groom, I believe. Three points for John de Groom. Brilliant. Double break there, I believe. And then the final pass. And then there will be a playoff between the two highest scorers. Come on, goats, comes the cry from my left. <laughs> Rampant goats all the way! <laughs> Gentlemen, you're in time! Go! 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 Hey! Ah, my, Lord's, um, my Lord Beaufort appears to have thrown this, so John de Groom wins. Ladies and gentlemen, three points for John de Groom! You're allowed to cheer him now if you want to, because he's actually on the good side. This gets terribly complicated, doesn't it? Oh! Oh! Handbags. I 
don't think they're very happy with Get each other, with do you? The <coughs> My Lord Beaufort, would you mind leaving him alone? We don't want any unsportsmanlike behaviour, do we? Come in. Is that a red dragon or a griffin? Boo! Red dragon! Both for the knights and for the beautiful horses! Thank you very much, my lords, ladies and gentlemen. You have been a fantastic and very vocal audience. Yeah! And I hand you back over to Mr. Chris Priest. The cannon is undamaged, unfortunately. And the plan to destroy the cannon by archery fire arrows has failed. Well, and the smoke slowly clears. And the advance begins. The bandits attack, attempting to use their infantry. Yay! The archers lose their weapons, their arrows, raining death from the sky. And return fire from the King's archers, William Barclay's archers, and advance on the far side. We can see the uh, green and yellow plumes of the Dudleys, or friends of the King. <laughs> and still the archers. Loose their arrows. And these arrows, ladies and gentlemen, if they were. Now, I can see, ladies and gentlemen, I can see a new banner entering the field. As the brigands Whoa. retreat, a royal banner enters the field. It is the king, King Edward the Fourth himself, entering the battlefield. It is one thing to fight over land with another baron, but to fight against the king, he'll be quaking in his boots. The mercenaries step back, lower their weapons. They are confused. Had they realised that the king was in residence, they would not have attacked William Barclay. They would have tried to find another way around the river. But no, and now Zapare. The bandit lord, Morgan Afluelin, a minor Welsh landover, and Lancastrian sympathiser come forward to speak with the king. He begs for mercy and pleads that he did not knowingly come to war against the king. The king is unmoved. An attack against England is an attack against the king. And an attack against the body of the king is treason. The leaders of this rabble will suffer a traitor's death. Faced with this grim ultimatum, Morgan chooses to fight on. Decision has been made. The fight will be taken to the king. Death or glory. The king and William Barton's forces begin an advance. Morgan and Llewellyn knows that this could be his end. But at least it's better than dying in some stinking hellhole of an oublier for the rest of his life. And slowly Ever so slowly, the King's force advances on this near flank, reorganizes his forces on both sides. The advance is strong, slow and very deliberate. Now they go in to the fight. And now it's come joined on the far side. The Dudleys and the Fitzgeralds, and now the brigands, archers, try to help their men by dropping swathes of arrows into the fighting horse. Now this is interesting, the uh, William Barker's forces have pushed forward but have gained very little ground, very, very slowly gaining 
Again saying inch by inch by inch. On the far side, there's been an encirclement that begins to be forced back to their old lines. There's hard clashes going on. The king is there, marshalling his troops. As is Clarence and Gloucester. And now the cannon is still loose. There seems to be a hiatus here. There's not a lot being moved forward. No further ground being given. The brigands are standing firm. And so the king's forces, alongside William Barclay, they withdraw, as do the brigands. Now the brigands are now bringing their infantry cavalry. Their cavalry. To out front the gun, in they go. Slashing away at these uh, poor forge in the middle. To no avail, they've, they've formed what the Scots would call a shilton. And a, a circle of uh, bills pointing outwards. And blinks tight together, shoulder to shoulder. And of course the horse will not break through that. He sends his fear. He's afraid for his life because of the, the bills pointing at him. And we'll just encircle them and carry on. And it's up to the man on his back to try and cut through and damage the Shilton defenders. Still he goes on. The cavalry's having very little effect. Uh, William Barclays is very strong. Well, well disciplined. So the cavalry retire. So the brigands attack once more. They're going to attack the guns. Keep your powder dry. Oh, at last the gunners have got someone. And so the brigands push, hoping that they'll find a way to escape the river across to Wales. Seems like the, the brigands are losing. The king charges in, fighting hard amongst his fellow compatriots. And I can see the brigands have been cut down and swayed, dead, dying. Morgan Appleman in his wounded. Steady fights on a brave man. For the king is victorious. Look, he stands there, surrounded by dead bodies of those who will do against him. And I'm getting wet. Get it finished. <laughs> and yes, they are needing to cut down the brigands, or brigands, or brigands are in retreat. The biggest archers, they're all away, they're run away, that's it. They can't face these men, they're gone. And the king is victorious. <laughs> William Barclay and King Edward IV are the victors. He stands over William Morgan Ap Llewellyn, drags him to his feet. And the man will now plead for his liberty. Flanked by three of the highest known knights in the world. King Edward, Duke of Clarence. And Duke of Gloucester, he begs forgiveness, he begs for his life, but he has committed a treasonable act. Oh! He fired to the end, Morgan up Llewellyn is cut down, and the king is victorious! And so the victory goes to Barclay and uh, King, king Edward, the House of York. I will now perform a small miracle before I'm swamped by the ever-incoming tide. The dead will rise! <laughs> they have travelled all from all over points of the country to be here today. We've just made it before the downpour occurs. I'm going to ask them to leave in their own time as quickly as they like. I thank you for your attendance, ladies and gentlemen.